Today is November 17th. My name is Lester Shorlock, and I'm representing the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. Uh, we have the pleasure today of interviewing Stanley Mackenberg, who lives on Ethan Allen Lane in Stanford. But we're doing the interview at our archives at 990 Hope Street in Stanford. The videographer is Stacy Schoenfeld. Good afternoon, Stanley. Good afternoon to you, Lester, and to you, Marcy, uh, our kind of competent videographer. Uh, Stanley, uh, your parents came to Stanford, and where did they come from? New York City. Uh, and before that? I have no idea. The Bro mm -hmm. they, in the Bronx, I know they were from the Bronx. Uh, did, were they, did they immigrate from Eastern Europe? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> they were both immigrants, both my father and my mother. And I have in my file someplace the boats that they came over and the information from the uh, immigration service as to when they came. Surprisingly enough, my father, whose name was Leo, is, late, is in the immigration service records is called Abel. Mm -hmm. But that, I understand that was his middle name, Leo Abel McEnroe. But that's what it was in the immigration records. And I'm, according to the family history, we were, they met each other on the Lower East Side of New York in the Educational Alliance. Yeah. And they got married. And then my mother's sister moved to Stanford, is my understanding. Of course, this is all family history, but I never verified it. And unfortunately, by the time I got around to wanting to know what happened, everybody was gone. There was nobody left alive. <clears throat> but my understanding is that they came to Stanford when I was two, so I'm not a native of Stanford. And people ask me if I'm a native of Stanford. They say no. I didn't get to Stanford until I was two years old. Yeah, so you know your mom came from Eastern Europe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she was born when? She, she was born the year after the Chayaria the year mm -hmm. after the cholera epidemic. She says yeah. they didn't keep records in those days. Now, whether she was born in Russia or whether she was born in Poland, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they came from. My yeah. father, according to family history, came from Stockholm, Sweden. They went from, the family went from Stockholm to England. And just like everybody in Florida goes up one grade, a bookkeeper becomes an accountant, an mm -hmm. accountant becomes a CPA, a CPA becomes a CFO. The, f the family history that I was told was that my father, my father's father was the manager of a, an opera house, a traveling opera company in England. My best guess is he was probably a stagehand, but they promoted mm -hmm. him after he died. Oh, okay. Uh, was this a Yiddish theater or? Uh, no, this is a, a reg regular London yeah. opera, uh -huh. regular opera company. But they came from England to the United States. Mm -hmm. And my aunt, uh, my aunt Lily spoke Swedish. My aunt Rose, who died at 104, spoke wonderful English with a, a gorgeous English accent. So I think she was born in England. Mm -hmm. But I think my father was born in Stockholm. But when I went to, to, in, in, to um, Sweden, I went to the archives in Stockholm, I could find no recollection at all about my family. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether they changed the name or what happened. But there's no record of them emigrating from Stockholm. Yeah. So do you think, uh, well, I guess you think your dad was born in Sweden? I have no idea. No idea. Uh, because in, with all the interviews we've done, uh, this is the first time I think we found anyone whose ancestors came from Sweden. If I had a guess, I would guess that they came across from Poland through Finland into Sweden mm -hmm. uh, in order to mm -hmm. escape with the Cossacks. Yeah. That, that would be my best that, guess. That, that sounds that's like logical. Yeah. Yes, that's very logical. At any rate, they, they moved. Evidently, they were invited to move to Stanford by my Aunt Minnie, Aunt Minnie Weinkrock. Mm -hmm. And they moved to Stanford, according to the family history, when I was two. 
And where did you live? We lived in 775 Atlantic Street, which is down in the south end, but south of the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. And 775 Atlantic Street, I don't know whether it's my recollection or where they told me it was my recollection, told me about it, but they said I got up onto the roof and I was looking down and everybody got all upset and excited about it. So ever since then I've had acrophobia. I can't look down from mm -hmm. any kind of a height without getting funny feelings in my, in my stomach. Do you remember, was it a tenement house? It was a, no, it was an apartment house. It's still there. I went past and looked at it recently. Mm -hmm. And the big lot that was next door with the huge cliff that used to be there is no longer there. The huge cliff, by the way, was a little bitty hill. But when mm -hmm. you're four years old, that was yeah. a huge cliff. But I remember in those days, we had an icebox. And I remember in the summertime, the ice man coming around in his horse drawn red and then all the kids running out and getting ice chips from yeah. the back of the ice wagon. And that was, that's a recollection that's very, very clear in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, ice man was Jack Lebowski. I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know that. The uh, apartment house you lived in, were there other Jewish families, do you remember? There was, it had to be one Jewish family, because there was Alfred Wolf, who was my playmate. At least I know he was there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my sister, who was six years older than I was, went to Cluden School, which was on the street, and I don't know the name of the street. Henry uh, Street. No, it's not Henry no. Street. It's the one that's south of Henry Street. Uh, Cluden, the old Cluden mm -hmm. School was between two streets. Mm -hmm. Henry Street and the, the street that, when you looked west, would be, be on the right. And she went to school there, and uh, again, the family story is that she came home and told my mother that they needed children for kindergarten, so uh, if they had any younger brothers or sisters to bring them over to kindergarten. And my parents made the great mistake of saying yes, and I started kindergarten when I was four. But unfortunately for me, I was not kindergarten material, so they promoted me into first grade, which was a big mistake, because you have this four-year-old competing with six-year-olds. That doesn't work too good. But that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, so you went to Clunan School. I went to Clunan School. And from there? For two years. And then from Clunan, we moved over to Summer Street. We lived at, not 1062, but it must have been 10, 1070 Summer Street. Mm -hmm. And we lived in the ground floor of a house, which was right next to my Uncle Joe's house. And uh, Uncle Joe Weinkra. And I remember, uh, we used to play, I, I played with Donny Sosnowitz in his barn. His, his house was next door to me. That was just north. And we used to play together. And Jeannie and Donny are the two people who I know the longest. I probably know them for probably 80 years or 78 years. Of course, Jeannie was the pesky little kid that we used to say, Jeannie, go away and stop bothering us. We're going to tell your mother about you if you don't, if you used to hang around us. So, so we used to play in the barn. Mm -hmm. Then from Summer Street, we moved to Quintar Terrace. And mm -hmm. I went to Rogers School, the old Rogers School, for, I guess, a couple of years. And that was during the Great Depression. And my father, oh, my sister had graduated high school in Stanford. And somehow, my father, who worked in New York, he worked for a uh, company called the New York Bridge Whist Club, which was a private club where there were card players and gamblers, I'm sure. And he was able to get, probably through his connections in the New York Bridge Whist Club, where he was the manager of some sort. I never knew exactly what he was. He was able to get her into Hunter, Hunter College. So we moved into New York because she had to be a resident of New York City. Mm -hmm. and. She went to Hunter College, and we moved to New York and lived in the Bronx. And I finished up my elementary school education in the Bronx and went to my first two years of high school in the Bronx. And then in 1938, we moved back to Stanford. The reason we moved back to Stanford was that my father and mother, or my family, my father and mother, bought a candy store. The candy store was at 460 Atlantic Street, which would be kind of diagonally opposite where the post office is now. And that's where that, what's the name of that huge building that's? UBS. Is that UBS? Yeah. 
Oh, okay. It's on the left-hand side of the street as you're going toward the railroad station on Atlantic Street? Well, I, I remember, because when I was a kid, I worked at Ace Baby Carriage, which okay. was across the street. And I can picture your mom and dad standing, because it had a deep vestibule in that right, store. Right, right. And I can picture them standing in the vestibule of the store, and it was yeah. a newspaper, cigars, right, right. candy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we used to go down to the railroad station bright and early in the morning, and they would deliver the, the foreign language newspapers, mm -hmm. and we would take them in a little red wagon, bring them back to the store, and sell them. And we sold penny candy, and in those days, you could come into the store, and you could buy a cigarette for a penny, and uh, you didn't get any matches when you bought a cigarette for a penny. And we also, in the summertime, there was Gruber's Dress Factory, which was around the corner. That I don't know, remember what the name of that side street was. Beckley Avenue. Was that what it was? Yeah. Okay. They remember Gruber's? Yeah, that's uh, Gruber's Dress Factory. Yeah, that's Gail Trell's grandfather. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we used to go there, and we used to bring uh, ice drinks for the mm -hmm. seamstresses and the, the people who worked there making dresses and coats and whatever they made, mm -hmm. and we used to sell it to them. And it was a very, very rough business. And I've got a story for you. We heard this from a folk singer who said, what's the difference between a seamstress in the ILGWU, the International Lady Garment, Garment Workers Union, and a psychiatrist? And the difference between the two of them is one generation. And that's that happened in, in my family. Yeah. Yeah. My, they they were immigrants. Mm -hmm. Worked in a candy store. My, they sent my sister to school. She became a teacher and worked in Stanford, and sent me to school. And I told my father when I got finished because we didn't have any money that I was going to work. I told my mother that I was going to work for a year and save up enough money to, so I could go to University of Connecticut. And she said, No, you have to go because if you get a taste of money, you're never going to go back to school. Mm -hmm. So she borrowed $300 from my Aunt Minnie, who was the wealthy one in the family. And Minnie Weinkert had the, and Joe Weinkert had the Daisy Kitty Shop. And sent me off to college and said, uh, my father said to me, okay, we got enough for the first year of college, and after that it's up to you, you're going to have to get scholarships if you want to finish. And so that's what I did. And so the tuition was $300? No. The tuition was $65 for a semester, and it was $25, $65 for a semester. A meal ticket, I think, was $60, and um, the room, uh, a room in, in a temporary barracks was $35, and then the ROTC gave me a uniform, and I hitchhiked back and forth to Stanford, mm -hmm. and that was 1940, and 1940 went up right up until the war. When you, uh, obviously, you must have helped out in your parents' store. Oh, of course, store. of course. Do you remember, were there other merchants surrounding them that you might read? Oh, sure. There was K&J, and that was, that was Jap a couple of Japanese who had a restaurant right next, just north of our store, and I used mm -hmm. to go there and eat every once in a while. And there was a tailor across the street who was very active in politics, a Greek ta tailor. I don't remember his name. Do you? No, I don't. Do you remember the tailor shop that was across the... the, the, the no, the, I remember the barber shop. Oh, okay. Uh, and then uh, Carp's Hardware, which is right down the street, right yeah. next to my Aunt Minnie's. And then it was Greenberg's, the, cl the children's clothing mm -hmm. store that was on that same block where right. my father's candy store was. Um, was Conspore on that block? Conspore? I don't remember. Yeah. But, uh, Levinson was across the street. Louis right, Lou Levinson, Levinson yeah. was across the street there. And Levine was down at the corner with the low end clothing store. I don't remember him at all. Yeah. And then there were, of course, on Main Street there was Sarner's. Uh, I remember there was Ruben's Hat Shop, which was right next to A.S. Beck, mm -hmm. further down, uh, kind of diagonally opposite, opposite the church, you know, down from the, yeah. the Stanford Theater. I worked in A.S. Beck, sold shoes when I was in, in high school. Mm -hmm. And also when I was in high school, I worked in, in Strauss stores, which was an automobile store on the corner of Summer and Main Street, mm -hmm. uh, across from uh, where the, the 
There's a restaurant there now. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of, in the back of the, of the city hall was an ice cream place. Louis, Louis Paul. Louis Paul. Mm -hmm. well, it was kind of opposite, Strauss stores was mm -hmm. kind of opposite Louis Paul. Mm -hmm. And we sold tires and we mm -hmm. sold batteries. And then on the square, there was a haberdasher. Uh, again, I can't remember his name. And I worked there for a while and mm -hmm. sold shirts and ties. And that, that haberdasher, you can see the square haberdasher, I think it was called. You can see it in the government center in the cafeteria. There's a big kind yeah. of mural like the ones yeah. that are over here. And you can see that. And I look at that and I think to myself, I worked there in 1940, mm -hmm. 1939, 1940. Well, you came back uh, to Stanford now. We'll go back a minute. And uh, you went to Stanford High School. I went to Stanford High School. I started in 1936. I was in Mr. Uh, let's see, I started high school in 36. We moved to Stanford in 38. And I went to Stanford High School in 38. Mm -hmm. And I was in Glen Moon's homeroom. And Glenn Moon was later in Rotary. He was the most marvelous teacher. Yes. He was just a superb teacher. And he was our, our American history teacher. And in my class was Donny Sosnowitz. And I remember Stanley Levine was in my mm -hmm. class, too. And Ray Koch, who, 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 I don't know what they call him, Ray or Red. Red. Red Koch. And uh, I'm trying to remember whether Mesh Bernstein was in, in that class or not. Uh, I think we had the quarterly here. Well, you gave me the quarterly from 43. Yeah. All right. So there were a whole bunch of people there. The, the other thing I remember about Stanford in the olden days, I remember the chicken market. My, there was a live chicken market my mother took me to. It was on the corner of West Main Street, uh, just across from where it's the Stillwater Avenue cuts off from Main mm -hmm. Street. And we used to go over there and bought live chickens. They would, the sheikh would slaughter the chicken, and they would give them to the lady who sat there with the apron who would fleck the chicken and then she would burn off the pin feathers with a gas flame that she could turn up and down. Mm -hmm. And then the thing that I liked the most was when she made the chicken soup and you had the little uh, eggs that were still inside yeah. the chicken that were just so good. So I remember that. Um, and uh, in 38, after we, we got out of, out of high school, we had the commercial course and the college course. And all the kids that I knew were in the course, in the college course, and didn't know from the commercial course. I remember Miss Billingsley was my English teacher. I got to tell you a story about Miss Billingsley. I was on the quarterly board, and I wrote for the quarterly magazine, which was the Stanford High School magazine. And they were always pushing me to do better. And when I came back to Stanford in 1951. I went to a restaurant in Stanford, and I saw Miss Billingsley eating her dinner in the restaurant. And I went up to Miss Billingsley and said, Miss Billingsley, I said, I'm Stanley Mackenberg, and I'm back in Stanford. And she said, oh, yes, what are you doing now? She says, well, I'm a dentist. And she says to me, well, I hope that you do a better job as a dentist than you did as a student, otherwise you're never going to be successful. <laughs> well, she, she was a tough lady. <laughs> I had her also, yes. Yeah, and then there was Miss Montgomery. I had her for yeah. one year. And I can't remember any of the other teachers that I had. Uh, so, Miss Wilbur, did you have her? She was there a long time. No. But after after we got it out of school, when we were finished at, 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 at high school, we would go down to the Jewish Center, and we'd go to Mr. Green's pool room, and that's where mm -hmm. we'd hang around. And we used to shoot pool for a nickel for 15 minutes, and then shoot stickers. <laughs> the yeah. loser would have to pay the dime. And I used to shoot with Donnie Sostowitz now. Mm -hmm. Donnie was a, was a great athlete. I am not an athlete mm -hmm. at all. So he would always spot me three balls, and I would always end up paying for it. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then they had a bowling alley down in the yeah. basement of the Jewish that Center. That was Pete Kweskin. Pete Kweskin, yeah. right. And he, that, you bowled duck pins down there. Yeah. And uh, they had the pool. I remember go, going swimming in the pool. Did you uh, go to Hebrew school upstairs? Oh. When we lived in Stanford before we moved to New York, I went to JC to the, to the Jewish Center mm. upstairs was Hebrew school, and that's where I went for for first grade for my Olive mm. days until we moved away, 
And then when we moved to New York, I went to the Jacob Schiff Center, which is on Valentine Avenue in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and that's where I was bar mitzvah. Oh, on Valentine Avenue. On Valentine Avenue, yeah. right. That neighborhood has changed quite a bit. We went back, and I couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah. I was afraid I was going to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, you spent some time in the Army. Well, I, I want to go back before that, because I, I asked you about that shul, which I really don't remember mm -hmm. at all. But what I do remember is I remember when they built the new shul, the one on Grove Street. Mm -hmm. And again, this was during the Depression, and they had built the, just the bottom of it. And I remember we used to go there for, for high holiday services. And run, young kids, of course, we were always running around for the high holiday services. And I remember Mr. Walensky used to pound on the, the banister around the, the uh, abima, abima with his uh, with his cheder, mm. with his book yeah. and he used to go sha 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 mm. and I remember young Kipper they always had a fundraising drive for the Hebrew school yes. you know, and how much are we and they'd auction off the aliyahs mm -hmm. for young Kipper and I remember going there yeah. and, then, and I remember also the Hebrew ladies educationally that was my aunt Minnie who ran that. Yeah, they had they would make the candle with the string that they would run around the cemetery with the string, and that would be the wick for the candle. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. And they would sit in the lobby, yeah, collecting money for the cemetery association. In interesting. Yeah. Uh, I do remember my aunt Minnie when I came back to Stanford in '51. My aunt Minnie was evidently president of the Hebrew Ladies uh, Educational. Society, League of the, Education League yeah. said to me, Stanley, she said, there's this poor family, they have to have their teeth fixed. I said, yes, Aunt Minnie. <laughs> she said, send us the bill. I said, yes, Aunt Minnie. <laughs> they never got a bill, you know that. <laughs> so the uh, Jewish Center was the, your meeting place. After oh, yeah. school, everyone yeah. went to the Jewish center. Yeah, and we had a we had a high school, a Jewish fraternity that met in the Jewish center mm -hmm. in high school, and where Mateo's restaurant is now up on Long Ridge Road. Yeah, we used to go there, and now at that time I was sixteen years old, fifteen mm -hmm. and sixteen years old. We used to go there for beer busts. Okay, nobody mm -hmm. paid any attention to the fact that these kids were drinking underage. Mm -hmm. Robert Redness was uh, was in that. Uh, was it Robert? Mm -hmm. The the father. I don't remember his first name. Okay, he was in that society. I remember mm -hmm. that. Mike Orleans was a friend mm -hmm. of mine in those days. Were most of your friends Jewish when you were in high school? Not most of my friends. Mm -hmm. All of my friends. All of your friends. I didn't know anybody who was not Jewish until I got to college. Oh. Unbelievable. Yeah. I was so restricted. When I was in the Bronx, I was in the uh, in the elementary school and everybody in my class was Jewish because it was a Jewish section. Mm -hmm. High school, every in New York high school, everybody was Jewish except for two kids. And when I went to came to Stanford in the home room, I only hung around with the Jewish kids. Even though I think Tony Poltrack was in my was in my high school mm -hmm. class, but I had nothing at all to do with it. Just stayed away. Uh, so I, I was really circumscribed. Do you think it was because it was, it was anti-Semitism, or you just found no. you were comfortable with no. your friends that you no. had that were Jewish? It, there was just no, never a question that, any, that, that you didn't associate with anybody who wasn't Jewish. Yeah. That's all there was to it. Were there, uh, in high school, was there you said there was a fraternity? Yeah, there was a Jewish uh, high school fraternity. Yeah. I don't remember the, what we it We don't was. have anything in our archives about that. That's interesting. Well, that was 1940 and I, 41 to, no, that was 38 to 40. Mm -hmm. Well, so shall we go back now to college and your okay. history program? Well, I went to, I got into UConn in 1940 and many supplying the funds for it. And uh, worked in the summer of between the summer of 1940. Let's see, no, that would be the, we, the semester started in the fall. The summer of 41 I worked, and then in December of 
42, 41 was Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And everybody I know who is my age knows exactly where they were when they heard about Pearl, Pearl Harbor and exactly what they were doing. It was a Sunday morning. I was in a dormitory called the Barracks. Somebody woke me up at 11 o'clock and said the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And I said, where's Pearl Harbor? Because nobody knew anything about it. And of course, everybody was really upset. And then I heard the famous Roosevelt speech about, uh, this is a, a date that will live in infamy. Mm -hmm. And then Eleanor Roosevelt came to the school to re to, in December to reassure us that everything was going to be all right. Then they started ROTC in the in University of Connecticut. Well, they had ROTC because it was a, it's a land grant college, and they had to have ROTC. But they took the, all the men and they put them in what was called the ASTP program. Now I don't know what ASTP is, student training program, and you would theoretically finish up your college degree, and then you would go to officers training school, or OCS. And offers a candidate school and you would be then commissioned as a second lieutenant. And the Army put a whole bunch of guys who joined the Army for the ASD pre program, and the Army did what it always does. The Army says, oh, you know what? We need infantrymen. You're now in the infantry. And my whole, whole class of men went into the infantry. I have no idea why I didn't do it, but I do remember that when I was called up by the draft board, my mother would go to the draft board and plead with them to give me a deferment so I could finish my education. And I went year round and I finished up my degree in the fall of uh, in September of 1943. I got my degree. Mm -hmm. And I then went to for my physical and I they told me I was 4F and I said, no, no, you gotta find a place for me someplace because I want to be in the army. I got a you know, join the army. So they said, all right, they put me in the medical department. I came home and told my parents, and they were horrified, just absolutely horrified. They told me that in Russia, soldiers would cut off their fingers so they wouldn't be in the army. And the fact that I could have gotten a deferment and chose to go into the army was just, they, they couldn't believe that I would be so, so foolish because in 1943, I had a lot of smarts, but I had no street smarts at all. Mm -hmm. None at all. I had academic smarts, and that was it. So I went into the Army because they told me I could go to dental school. And I said, that's great. I got into the Army, and they said, oh no, we got another place for you. So they put me in a medical unit, and because I had a bachelor's degree in chemistry, they made me a ward boy, a bedpan commando, because mm. <laughs> all I could do was be in the wards and help the, the soldiers who were injured who were in the hospital. And where was where was that located? <sighs> Let's see. First in Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Then no, I guess originally in Camp Kilner in New Jersey, which was very nice because I was able to go home on weekends when I could get a pass. And from Camp Kilmer to Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, where I was able to go into Manhattan and see all the Broadway shows for nothing through the USO. That was 1943 and very early 1944. And then uh, they assigned me to a hospital ship, the USS Chateau Thierry. And the hospital ship then went down to Abilene, Texas, and we trained in Abilene, Texas. And from there, we went up to uh, Massachusetts, to Taunton, Massachusetts, where we embarked in Brooklyn, in, in the Boston Navy Yard on board the ship. The whole unit went on board the ship. And I was very excited. The first time I was ever away from Stanford, outside of being in, in New York or Connecticut and I was going to go see the world, and I was going to be safe because I was on a hospital ship with the Red Crosses all illuminated at night so the U-boats wouldn't sink us. And I, they marched us up onto the boat and told us to go over by the rail and to put down our duffel bags, and I did. Now the boat is tied up at the dock, 
and a ton went by. And the boat goes like this. And I got seasick right then and there. And for three months, I stayed seasick. <laughs> they were not happy with me on this boat, you can guess. So uh, we went across to the Mediterranean. I was in Viserti, and I was in Casablanca, and I was in Naples. And then we came back to the United States, and we docked at the Charleston Navy Yard, and they took me off the ship for chronic seasickness. And through good fortune of meeting somebody in the personnel department while I was in the Charlie Charleston Navy Yard in the replacement depot, I was able to get my Army uh, work number changed from a ward boy, a, a ward attendant, to the laboratory. And that was due to the good offices of a whack that I met, a whack from the Bronx, who falsified my records for me. Yeah. And so I was put on, I was then assigned to another general hospital to the laboratory, because when I was graduated as a chemist, a biochemist, I'd learned all the laboratory tests, so I knew exactly what to do. And in the, we, I was part of a general hospital, and the general hospital went from Charleston, South Carolina, to Glasgow, to, lo, to, to one of the locks in Scotland, just outside of Glasgow. And we stayed there, and I didn't know it at the time, but that we were waiting for the invasion. So I was able to get to Glasgow, and I was able to get to Edinburgh, and I was, <laughs> because they, we weren't doing any laboratory work, they had been uh, shoveling coal into the officers' stoves in their huts to keep them warm. It was all right. After the invasion, after D-Day, which is June 6, 1944, after they finished working through the hedgerows in Normandy, they load us on board a, a I guess it was some kind of a, a, a ship, and moved us over from Southampton to Le Havre. And in Le Havre, they put us on 40 and 8s. A 40 and 8 was a French railroad car which could hold 40 horses, 40, which could hold 40 men or 8 horses. And we went on that 40 and 8 to Verdun, France, to a French, an old French hospital. And that's where I stayed until Germany uh, was, de Germany was defeated. I was in that hospital during the Battle of the Bulge when the Germans were coming right smack straight through to Verdun. And I tell you, I was scared stiff because I knew what would happen. The Germans ever overran this, and there I was with this H on my dog tags for Hebrew, mm -hmm. and I knew what was going to happen to me. But fortunately, we, they stopped the Germans, and so that was okay. Uh, interestingly enough, when I was in the hospital, one of my classmates from my high school in New York was wounded, and he was in the hospital, so I was able to reestablish my contact with him. Stayed in Verdun until uh, the until Germany was defeated, and then they were going to pack up the hospital and send it out to Japan because they were talking about the Japanese invasion. You probably remember that. They dropped the bomb, and Japan surrendered. And the hospital no longer had any use. And they then started a big program about repatriating soldiers, bringing them back. And it depended on the number of points you had. And I had a lot of points because I had been in three different theaters of operation. But uh, I was declared essential. And they started a program to keep soldiers entertained. And part of it was a football program. Now, I had played intramural football when I was in, in college, in fraternity football. And they picked my name out of the file, and they sent me off to Reims, France. And there, I'm with these Goliaths, these huge guys. All white, by the way. The mm -hmm. army was still segregated at that point. 
here all these Goliaths and skinny little Mackenberg who weighs at that time 120 pounds with a 28 inch waistline, which is no longer there. And I'm there, and the co coach takes one look and he says, Mackenberg, he says, go home. And I looked at him. And I said, by that time, I had started to get a little bit of street smarts. Mm -hmm. I said to him, Coach, I said, you're going to need somebody to take care of these guys' needs from day to day. You're going to need somebody to take care of the equipment, to make sure everything is all right, and to make sure they get their cigarette rations, mm -hmm. and to, to, to run errands for you. You're not going to do it yourself. He said, why don't you make me the manager of the football team? He says, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so I was the manager of the football team. It was great. <laughs> it was terrific. So we were in Reims, and we played some games. Uh, we went to Luxembourg. I don't ever remember going to Germany. I do remember being on a bus going to a football game and a general who was in charge of our sector came over and he said, we got a, and he was a little bit of a guy with a Napoleonic complex like they all are. And he said to the team, now you got to win because my rival who I, who's a general in charge of the sector that you're fighting and I have always been rivals and I want you to win and it's important that you win for me. And somebody in the bus laughed and he got mad as hell and he looked at me and he says, soldier? He says, I see you didn't shave. I said, no, sir, I have a rash. He says, you go to sick hall? I said, no, sir. He says, well, don't ever let me see that again. He took it out on me, <laughs> which was fine and dandy because I didn't care. Anyway, we went down some months later to Nice, France to play. The football team went to Nice, France to play. Mm -hmm. And we, we were not bivouacked in the George V Hotel, but I do remember walking into that hotel in East France and walking into a crap game and shooting crap down there in the ballroom, which was my only claim to fame. And then I was repatriated to the United States on an uh, emergency leave because my mother-in-law had died. I had gotten married in the meantime. So she had died, so I mm -hmm. went back. And I was stationed in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and stayed there until I was discharged. When I was discharged, I went to uh, when I was discharged, I went to the Leahy Clinic, and I worked in the Leahy Clinic as a laboratory clinic technician for a few months, and then went down to Miami to Miami Beach. And I went out to Miami Beach to finish up the credits that I needed for going to dental school. And that was in 1946. Mm -hmm. And in, I worked as a waiter in one of the hotels down there. It was all Jewish at that time, all Jewish people. It wasn't the South Beach that's there now. And I went to the University of Miami and I took two courses because I needed a year of biology. I took elementary biology and advanced biology. And they said to me, you can't do that. And I said to them, but I'm a veteran. People were very nice to veterans in those days. They said, well, all right, we'll let you do it, but it's going to be on your own head if you fail. Well, fortunately, the elementary biology course was in the morning. And the advanced biology course was in the afternoon. So when they were doing the advanced biology course, they repeated what the elementary biology course had just finished, so I ended up with the top A's in both, <laughs> both classes. It was just, just luck, just mm -hmm. plain ordinary luck. If it had been the other way, I would have flunked out. I then applied to dental school, and I was accepted in the College of Dentistry in San Francisco and in Columbia. There's no choice. My folks are in Stanford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Went to I tell my kids, if you have your choice between being lucky and being smart, pick lucky every time. My folks horrified at the idea of me going into the Army. I ended up with two and a half years, which was 24, 30 months of education under the GI Bill, mm -hmm. which was enough to carry me through four years of dental school. And living in New York, near the school, and when we ran out of, and we also got a stipend. I think we got forty some odd dollars a month, or eighty dollars a month as a stipend. I had enough to to live on. And when I ran out of money at the end of the month, my father would come down and pick us, pick me up with my wife, and we could go back up to Stanford. And 
they, they'd feed us for the weekend and give me a $10 bill and I was all set until the beginning of the month again. And I went to dental school and I worked three jobs while I was in dental school. And I consider myself to be extremely fortunate. When I finished with dental school, I took my New York State boards, I took my Connecticut boards, and I looked for a place to practice. And I looked at, I got some offers to practice in New York State, up around the Adirondacks area. They really wanted me up there because they had nobody at all. <clears throat> so they really wanted me up there. And I looked at a number of cities uh, about where they were, and I looked at the ratio of dentists to population, and I looked at the educational facilities and what was available and what might be of interest to me as a young practitioner. And I made a big chart and I put it on the living room floor and I looked at it and I decided to come to Stanford because that's where my folks were. So, <laughs> fortunate. Uh, my sister's and brother-in-law's best friend was Dr. Swedlow in Stanford, Connecticut. He had a house on Summer Street get the number. I should remember it. He had a dentist, Herb Edelson, who was rented space from him. And Herb decided to move out of that space and move downtown. So Bernie Swedlow says, Stanley, he says, you can come. Well, Herb said to me, I'm going off on vacation. He said, you can use my office. I had just gotten my uh, my license. He says, you can use my office until I get back, which I thought was wonderful. I mean, I thought that was just such, such a wonderful thing for an offer to make for him. So he moved out, and Bernie Sweatlow said, okay, you can rent the office $40 a month, and you can, there's a, back, there's a room in the back of the, of the office, and you can live back there. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Because I came to Stanford, I was for $300 in debt. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a pot to piss in. And under the GI Bill, I bought used equipment and opened an office. And Bernie Swedlow, who had a lot of Medicaid patients, would take the Medicaid patient and bring him into my office and say, here, sit down and have your teeth fixed. <laughs> Jack Levinson, who was also a mishpocha in the family, would call me up every once in a while. And he said, Stanley, I'm sending somebody over. He needs a tooth pulled and he needs a filling, and I don't want you to charge him any more than $5. And my answer was always, yes, Jack, be quiet mm -hmm. because it was $5 more than I had before he sent the patient in. Mm -hmm. And he sent in my very good friend, Ronnie King, Ronnie and Lucille King, $5 to fix their teeth for every mm -hmm. visit, and that's what I did. It was $5 for every visit. And Ronnie said to me many years later, he says, you know, Stanley, he says, we didn't have anybody in those days, but you did an outstanding job, except the materials you used are terrible. He says, 28 years later, look at this, the filling broke. <laughs> <laughs> he turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful friend. Yeah. I was in Stanford at the right place at the right time, and that's so important because some of my fellow student, fellow uh, graduates ended up and were not terribly successful. One of them went to Honolulu. The top, top academic dentist in the class went to Honolulu. And when my dental assistant, who I hired right out of high school, went to Honolulu with her husband, who was in the Army, and I sent her to Kenny Murakami, Kenny said, I'd love to hire you, but I can't do it because I'm not busy enough. Mm -hmm. So I had some people who were watching for me. Bernie Swettle was watching for me, Jack Levinson was watching, and of course the family was there, and that was very helpful. And I decided that I wanted to practice the way I had been trained. So the patients came in, and I said, okay, this is what you need, full mouth series of x-rays, examination, it was five dollars, one third, and then I would do a diagnosis and a treatment plan, and one-third of the patients who came into my office for that walked out because I was too expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to do, I was going to do too much work for them. But I persevered. The other thing that happened is I remember 
I, I don't remember what, I, I, this is, I think, a fantasy on my part. But I remember when we were in Stanford, toward, before we moved to New York, that my mother sent me to the Visiting Nurses Association Dental Clinic. 25 cents a visit. Because evidently we didn't have enough money for me to go to the dentist. Mm -hmm. So I used to go there and they took care of me when I was a kid. I must have been eight, nine years old, something like that. When I got my license, which was, I got my license in a telegram on a Sunday night in 1951. In the I think it was either August or early September. And Monday morning, I went down to the Visiting Nurses Association and I said, you know what, you took care of me when I was young. I'm volunteering to come in and work here in your clinic. Mm -hmm. Payback. They were very happy about this because, you know, nonprofit places always, always mm -hmm. want volunteers. So I worked there for a couple of years, and then when the director left, they said, Stanley, you want to be the director? And I said, sure, I'll be the director. And I was the director of the Visiting Nurses Association Dental Clinic until they closed it up and the DNA, you know, moved from Guernsey Street. Remember when they closed it up? Yeah. Okay. That was Mrs. Krushchank. Was That's Mrs. Krushchank, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. With wonderful antiques. Mm -hmm. She and I got along very well. And so that was fine and dandy. And then Larry Pearson, who was a, a president of the Stanford Dental Society, called me up and said, Stanley he says, Stanford Hospital wants to start a dental clinic. Would you, would you be willing to, to run it? And I said to him, Larry, I said, I'll be glad to. And he says, I'm surprised. He says, because I know how busy you are. I said, Larry, I'm getting a divorce. I got nothing to do anyway, so I'll go work. I'll start the dental clinic on one provision. No committees. I do it by myself. If it works, I want all the credit. If it fails, I want all the blame. So I set up the whole dental clinic. I bought all the equipment. I bought all the tools. I hired all the people. And I hired and I got all of the dentists to come volunteer and work for them by putting them on the staff. Prestige, mm -hmm. right? Can't pay in money, but I'll give you prestige. Mm -hmm. Stanford Hospital, uh, an attending dentist. And when the new dentist, well, when I first came to Stanford and I was looking for an office, and this was back in 51, I'd go see some of the dentists who were around, and every one of them would say the same thing. Stanley, Stanford is too full of dentists. There's no room for another dentist. Go to New Canaan, go to Greenwich, go to Darien, go to Norwalk, go to Porchester. Okay. When new dentists came to see me, I said to them, you know what? If I wanted to, Stanford, as I said, is a wonderful town. If you're a good dentist, you will do very well. And if I was coming to Stanford as a new dentist, I would find the busiest dentist in Stanford, and I would open an office right next to him, hoping I would get his overflow. Mm -hmm. You want to come to Stanford, you come to Stanford. It's a great place to practice if you do good work. So. And then when they came to Stanford, I'd take them out for lunch and I would say, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Remember Tom Sawyer whitewashing the fence? Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to let you whitewash the fence. I'm going to let, give you the opportunity to be a de attending dentist at Stanford Hospital. I want you there one morning a week, one morning a month. So I ended up with 30 dentists on my staff. And it was great. We ran a great clinic. We cleaned up the whole backlog. Bill Rosenfield, who was very interested in geriatric dentistry, mm -hmm. who had lived in Stanford, had an office in, in Darien. Bill Rosenfield said, Stanley, I want to open up a geriatric clinic. I want to make dentures for old people and take care of old people. I said, be my guest. So we ran a geriatric clinic, and we ran at Stanford's dental clinic for a number of years. And I ended up on the council of, uh, the hospital council of the uh, State Dental Association. And I found out at one of these hospital meetings that Tufts Dental School was looking for places to send their senior dental students to, as externs. So I called up, I, I went, I found out about the program and I went to the hospital and I talked to the Dr. Smith, Gene Smith I think was his name, who was in charge of the medical interns and residents. 
And I said to him, listen, we can bring down a dental extern here for six weeks at a time, no cost to the hospital, all we have to do is feed him and bed him, give him a place to sleep and give him, uh, feed him. He says, well, I don't know, Stanley. He says, what dental school is this? I said, it's Tufts Dental School. He says, oh, Tufts Dental School? He says, I went to Tufts Medical School. He says, Stanley, no problem, which only goes to show you, Lester, it's not what you know, it's who you know every single time. <laughs> I taught that to my kids, too. So we ran this very successful dental extern program for Tufts, and I would go up there once a year for a Tufts faculty conference, and one day I was riding up in the elevator with some of my friends, and I said, I'm part of the outhouse faculty. Mm -hmm. And the head of the oral surgery department says, Dr. Mackenberg, he said, you are just as much a member of the faculty as I am. I says, it doesn't matter whether you're in-house or out-house, you're still a member of the faculty. <laughs> so uh, I ran that program, and the feedback was that uh, this was the second most desirable program to go to. New York Governor's Island, which was where the Army people were, was number one, and Stanford was number two. And I was just, just absolutely delighted with it. And so was Tufts Dental School, because they made me an assistant to clinical professor until we closed up the clinic because we had run out of things to do. We had taken care of all the backlog. So we closed, closed the clinic. And Stanford was without a clinic until they opened up another clinic, which was the one they opened up over at Henry Street and Clunan School. Mm -hmm. And that was many years later after I had retired. Anyway, uh, I worked in Stanford and very happily. It was a wonderful place for me. Where, where was your office? When you I started went? off with Bernie Swedlow on Summer Street. Yeah, Bernie Swedlow was an MD. He was an MD. And then I went off to Morgan Manor. 95 Morgan Street. I had an office there, mm -hmm. and I had a, I had the most wonderful time being a dentist. I I remember the, I remember the day I decided. I said, when I grow up, I want to be a dentist. I remember where I was. I was on Fordham Road in the Bronx, just west of Jerome Avenue. I had just come from the dentist, and I said to myself, when I grow up, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I am such a lucky person because I can't imagine anything worse than saying to yourself when you get up in the morning, oh God, i got to go to work again today. Yeah. I had the most wonderful time. I worked for 40 years as a dentist. When did you retire? At the end of 89. I, mm -hmm. I woke up one morning and I said to Harriet, it's not fun anymore. I said, every morning I used to wake up and say, oh boy, I wonder what kind of a challenge I'm going to find this, find this time said, I've been waking up lately and saying, oh my God, I wonder who's going to bother me this time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to retire at the end of the year. And fortunately, I had already brought in a partner. We had made all our arrangements. So mm -hmm. the transition was very easy. He had worked in, for me for five years, mm -hmm. with me for five years. And when I told him I was going to retire, he said, no problems at all. I walked out. He took over the whole practice. Mm -hmm. and it was a seamless transition. Seamless. And that was 21 years ago. And I said to Harriet, and I remember I talked to her, it was in July of, of 89, I said, I'm going to retire at the end of the year when I finish up with all the work I'm doing. And I said, I'm really anxious about it, because I don't want to be one of these guys who stands in front of the library at 9 o'clock in the morning waiting for it to open so they can read the newspaper because they have nothing else to do. She says, I can understand you being anxious. Why don't you make a list of what you want to you know, all the things you always wanted to do. And I said, what a good idea. And I made the list. And it's 21 years later, and you know what? I'm already halfway down the list. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. So you're not bored. I have it. I am you not. wake up in the morning, you don't say, what am I going to do today? No, I wake up in the morning and I say, oh, God, I'm going to be able to get everything done today that I want to get done. And I've been very fortunate. Fortunate professionally fortunate financially, mm -hmm. fortunate emotionally. I got two great kids. That's Where are your kids? kids? I got one in California and I got one in Colorado. Oh. The one in California will take about six hours to drive to Las Vegas. The one in Colorado takes about six hours to drive to Las Vegas. So mm -hmm. they're both coming to Las Vegas to have Thanksgiving together with their families. 
Oh. So this year, next Wednesday, we're flying to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Thanksgiving with the kids on Thursday, and then we're flying to Sarasota for the winter time on Friday. Because I found out something interesting. I found out you don't have to shovel rain. So do you have grandchildren? I have twin grandsons who are 14. We're mm -hmm. just bar mitzvah last year. Granddaughter who's 12 will be bat mitzvah, mitzvah this coming year. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's three grandchildren. What are your children's names? Marcy is the one in Colorado. She's the older daughter. Mm -hmm. And Lisa is the younger daughter, and she is in California. Oh. Marcy is a... Marcy's both right and left brain. She plays music. She sings. She is... Uh, running a manager of a, a small real estate business. Mm -hmm. She is uh, r renting and, and making sure that everything goes well, you know, as any real estate manager yeah. would be. And she also is working, f she's a, she is trained as a geologist, but she is now working as an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And she got a job, and they're now working on a report. She's working for a company that does surveys of land that's going to be developed for one thing or another, I don't know. And th their job is to go out and survey it, look for all the sites, to look for mm -hmm. the old Indian sites and the old early settler sites. She's just overjoyed at what she does. I mean, she just enjoys it all over the place. The younger daughter, Lisa, who has the children, the grandchildren, is a hypnotherapist in California. Of course, that's the place to go if you mm -hmm. want to be a hypnotherapist. You go to California. She's got her own, she teaches at the Hypnosis Motivation Institute, mm -hmm. and she also has her own web TV program, and she has a program on television every week. My daughter, the television star. <laughs> and I tell you, I am so proud of both of my kids, it's just great. Well, that's it's great that they bring you such an office. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So Stanley, you've been in Stanford a good long time. What, are you, what is your feeling about what the city of Stanford looks like today compared to when you were a youngster? Do you think it's better or do you think it's not so good? What's your take on it? The, the gut reaction, the immediate reaction would be what everybody else does. I hate it because everybody thinks when they were young, things were better now than they are right now. When I was young, all the children were better behaved. When I was young, life was a lot simpler. When I was young, we didn't have all these problems. That's a lot of baloney. Mm. The good old days were terrible. Today is the good old days. Mm. Today is the best kind of days. The only thing that's constant is change. Stanford is going to change. It's changed all my life, ever since I've been here. And it's going to continue to change. And I don't know whether the change is going to be for better or for worse, but it's going to change. The way Stanford has changed in the past has been very beneficial to me. We were talking the other day about back in the 50s when all the young people, all the young Jewish couples were coming to Fairlawn. Remember that? Sure. And everybody went to Fairlawn, mm -hmm. and then Fairlawn, that's where they rented the apartments. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they went off to Bracewood Lane, and that's mm -hmm. where they rented the apartments. And they belonged to the couples club in the Gurdjieff Shalom. And they all got to know one another. And were things better in those days? Things were tough. They were really tough. It was tough when I started out in, 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 in terms of building my practice. I worked for eight years in New York, mm -hmm. part-time for a dentist. I learned a lot when I worked in New York. And I hope at this point I've got at least a few street smarts, which <laughs> is where I'm going to go back to. So <laughs> that helps a lot. And I'll, all I can say is that Stanford has been very, very good to me. And I hope I've been good to Stanford. I hope I have accomplished things. I'm very proud of the fact that I got just a load of kids who were running around who, who I was particularly concerned with making sure that children were not afraid of the dentist. And I just took care of loads of kids who have no qualms at all about going to the dentist. They, they think that going to the dentist is just a lark. So. Well, it's great. It's been great hearing your life story, <laughs> and uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed telling us about it.
Sure. How mm -hmm. often do you get a chance to brag about what you've been doing? <laughs> well, you're very fortunate that uh, you're you're so upbeat about you know all your challenges in life and that you've been in the right place at the right time. That I think that's probably Lester one of the most important things that I have learned in my life. You've got to be in the right place at the right time, and you have to be lucky. And Harriet keeps saying to me. You work very hard to be lucky, and I said yes, but you still have to be in the right place at the right time. Right. Because you can be the best, the best dentist in the world, and if you're in the wrong place, you're never going to get a chance to show it to people. Thank you. My pleasure.